Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. The Shroud of Turin. Some claim it is the actual shroud that was wrapped around Jesus after his death. The image burned into the fabric, and the blood which stained the shroud are said to be proof. Others, however, claim that the evidence isn't strong, and that the image and blood are fake. Now Parachute presents... The Shroud of Turin, with special guest, Russ Brielt. How's it going, para fans? Welcome to another episode of Paratruth Radio. I'm sexy and I know it. I'm sexy and I know it. <laughs> Darn goat. <laughs> My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And tonight is a great night. As always, it is Paratruth Radio Night. Woohoo! So, uh, on the very first note of the evening, how has your week been? It's been going all right. Uh, you know, first week back to work after a few weeks off, so kind of a struggle getting back into the swing of things, if you will, but, you know... It's not bad. It's summer, at least. You get to spend some time outdoors. You? Ah, uh, same old stuff, different day. Uh, still looking for a, a place to work, so I'm going to keep at it until it happens. I know <laughs> the right job is out there. Just got to work on it. Right, right. And if you folks haven't noticed, Eric has lost his hair. He misplaced mm. it somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I actually heard that exact same thing at the beginning of the week. It was weird. <laughs> Walked into the into the. I walked into work, and uh, one of my friends there said, it "Looks like you, your hair ran away." <laughs> so yeah, he said, "Well, he he looked down. He said, well, mine is actually actually has ran away. <laughs> you just got rid of yours.'" <laughs> so I dig it. He's bald for real. <laughs> no, he's got hair, but you know, it's just oh, receding, <laughs> running away from his face. Not much. <laughs> So, folks, tonight we've got an awesome episode for you. We're bringing on Russ Brolt to talk about the Shroud of Turin, which is supposedly the wrap that Jesus Christ was buried in after his crucifixion. Uh, It's one of those controversial pieces, just like uh, the Spear of Destiny that we talked about last week. Uh, Actually, I don't know if you saw, but a viewer on YouTube actually had commented and said supposedly all of the the pieces of the passion have been recovered. The cross, supposedly. yeah, the nails, the the uh, crown of thorns, and all those other pieces that we've been talking about. Yet, uh, uh, last as for today. well, I don't know where he gets his information from, but I know recently I was looking uh, or not looking, but watching a TV show about the cross, and they're saying you know they haven't found anything. All they have are little t- what they believe are little tiny slivers of what could be the cross. Okay, uh, but they don't have the actual cross itself. As for the nails, you know we we covered one uh, last week with one of the spears of destiny, which uh, you know one of the kings put so what was supposedly a nail that was used in the crucifixion. Which again, you know obviously there's no proof to that. But I'm not saying that they're not all collected, but then again, there's no proof either. Well, that's that's what he was saying to supposedly because the, they can be faked. So there's not a hundred percent. I mean, we're only able to give the the knowledge that we're given from other people. Right. So unless, of course, we're the ones that have actually <laughs> discovered those things. So all right, folks. So uh, I think without further ado, we're going to go to the line with our guest Russ Brolt. 
All right, Russ, welcome to Paratruth Radio. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. It's my pleasure to be with you. So uh, for everybody that uh, is uh, listening right now, tell them a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your research. Well, I've been a lifelong researcher on the Shroud of Turin, uh, and um, just just got uh, with a, a writer for the college newspaper all the way back in 1980, and uh, the news of the, all the scientists that having gone over there there to, to Turin, Italy to to uh, to study this artifact was just getting a lot of attention, and I I was very intrigued. I wrote a couple articles for the college newspaper and did a lot of research, and I got hooked, and I I've been involved ever since. Okay, so through your research, which doing the research that I did, the the uh, carbon dating that everybody has found is that this piece of fabric only dates back to the Middle Ages. Has there been more research on that? Oh, yeah. What's interesting is that, you know, it, it, it's for, for, for some strange reason, carbon-14 is the only outlier that would suggest that the cloth is not authentic. And that's the, that's the irony, is that everything else that we see, whether it's, the, whether it's the blood forensics or looking at the image itself, which is not the result of any kind of artistic substances and the and the fact that the uh, that the that the that the shroud appears to be a, a genuine Jewish burial shroud that that would have been used uh, you know circa first century um, pollen on the cloth that that demonstrates that the cloth was in the was in the Middle East at some point in its history and and um, everything seems to uh, to to indicate that this cloth is probably authentic yet we have this one outlier and then of course then when we dig down and realize what uh what what happened in 1988 then we could become a little skeptical about about the carbon dating results itself because they were you know they were supposed to cut three samples from three different locations on the cloth instead they cut one sample from the outside corner edge exactly where it had been held and handled hundreds of times so as i always tell audiences you know if you were looking for the worst possible sample location right. pick from one of the two outside <laughs> corners which is exactly what they did and so then enter enter more research uh... looking at some spectrographic data and uh, and then and then and then ray rogers a uh, 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 thermal chemist with los alamos national laboratory he began to suspect that uh, that perhaps there was something anomalous with that corner, and he obtains a thread sample from from right at that same location where the sample was cut, mm -hmm. and then compares it with a thread sample from the main body of the shroud. And guess what? They're not the same. They are chemically different, which indicates uh, that perhaps that corner was subjected to some kind of a medieval reweave or some kind of a some kind of a, a uh, repair at some point, okay. and so now we're questioning. Well, what did we date? Because because now that you limit it from from three samples down to one, you have nothing else to uh, to to uh, to compare it with. And um, now some of the latest dating research came out of Padua University in um, in Italy back in 2013. Uh, researchers, you know, I mean, here we are. It was carbonated in 1988. Here we are, 2016. So we're 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 28 years past carbon dating, and there's mm. no been there's been no attempt to carbon date it again. So these guys have said, well, maybe there's another way that we can date this shroud. And so they began collecting samples of other linens of a known age, about a. a, a, a about a dozen linen samples dating from today, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, all the way back to five thousand years old, and they assess the rate of chemical and mechanical decay in these other linens, mm -hmm. and then compared the rate of chemical and mechanical decay with the, with uh, with shroud fibers, and they determined that the shroud had a had a comparable date range of 280 BC to 220 AD, that puts first century right smack in the middle. So now who's right and who's wrong? And um, so the whole dating thing has been quite a, uh, quite a, 
a debacle, and and it really starts with the fact that they violated the sampling protocol right. by not taking a sufficient number of samples. Right. So now, I mean, obviously carbon dating can be a little pricey, but why not just go ahead and carbon date it? I mean, why did they not do it, and why have are they not doing it, you know? Well, because uh, uh, number one, we're talking about the Catholic Church, and the and the uh, because that's uh, that who is, that who has long term been the custodian of the shroud, and ever since 1983, it's been owned by the by the current living pope, and so and so once they you know once they gave a uh, a a medieval date 1260 to 1390. You know, they were they were kind of forced into uh, into um, accepting that date. Um, I think at, at this point, um, the uh, the Catholic Church takes it. They don't take a position that it is or isn't authentic. They don't uh, they don't call it a relic and they don't call it an icon. They call it a symbol of Christ's suffering worthy of veneration. And the use of the word symbol is probably pretty smart. Because, because in that way, they don't have to get into the fray as to whether it is or it isn't. It's like, you know, it, you know it's up to you. You decide whether you think the shroud is authentic or not. And so I actually think that that kind of uh, a position that they've taken just basically says, listen, we're not going to do any more research on this thing. Uh, it is what it is. And, it's, um, and so it's really up to the individual person to decide. Um, mm-hmm. Now... Despite that, I mean, there's a lot of independent research that is that that is still ongoing, and the reason that I've been involved all these all these years it goes back to its uh, to its potential, and that is this: you know, if the shroud is authentic, then that makes it the most valuable artifact on the planet, mm-hmm. bar none. And so, and so the fact that, and so the fact that, I mean, I mean, I mean, here we've invested hundreds of thousands of scientific man hours into trying to explore and understand this mystery and yet it remains unsolved we can't figure this thing out i mean that to me is just is just mind blowing in the fact i mean as i always say you know if this was an obvious work of an artist we would have figured that out 100 years ago i mean so i, I, I mean so the fact that this does remain so perplexing even in the even in the 21st century, really suggests that you know you know maybe this thing is authentic after all, and um, and so I just I just refuse to just uh, you know to uh, um, to just say well carbon dating spoken end of story no 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 there's a lot more to the story. Well, now last week uh, we had actually discussed between us and a uh, another podcaster about the uh, Spear of Destiny, the Holy Lands, and supposedly the Catholic Church has that as well. Well, it's in the, it's in the Hofburg Museum in, um, in, uh, in Austria. I don't think it's owned by the Catholic Church. It's actually part of the Hofburg collection. Okay. Well, that, that was one of the other places that we had saw that there, it was claiming to be, but the Catholic Church is supposedly claiming they have it. Um, well, there's about there's about three spears that are all vying to be right. the spear of destiny, right. and it's uh, you know so the the, uh, the the problem with that is how do you know? Right, and, and, yeah, and right. this is the problem with and this is the problem with anything that uh, that that purports to be a um, a relic, and um, it, you know you you know so here this is this is the bones of so-and-so and so we have so now today we live in a very skeptical age we live in a scientific age you know 150 years ago if you went to a, a church in um in um in paris and they claimed to have you know the crown of thorns you said well it must be they have the crown of thorns nobody really questioned it but now we don't live in that age anymore, mm. and so and so we live in a skeptical age. And so a church says, "Well, we have the bones of Saint of Saint, you know, Thomas," and you just say, "Yeah, maybe." You know, <laughs> how do you know? And right. it's, uh, but the uh, but the but the the incredible wonder of the shroud is the fact that you have a 14 foot long linen cloth with a front and back image of a five foot ten bearded crucified man covered with blood stains that perfectly. Ma- that's the whole gospel account. Well, that's not just a relic. That would be like finding Noah's Ark. I mean, I mean, so it, so it, 
it's 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 really in the, in a in in a in a league of its own because it is testable and measurable and um and so uh, and and so that's why the shroud is so wonderfully intriguing now what are the things that now I, i've watched a couple of you know di- different uh, shows on the History Channel and Discovery Channel about the Shroud. And one of the things that were mentioned is, of course, the image of what would appear to be Christ on it. Now, they were saying that the image isn't necessarily on top or on the bottom of the Shroud, but is actually somehow burned, and that's the term they used, burned within the material itself. Uh, and, you know, it has something to do with the possibility of the Lord's light and, and just how bright and how hot it burned when uh, he, he was resurrected. Now, is that something you can go into a little bit and perhaps uh, to just yeah, explain? One of, the, one, one of the most intriguing attributes of the shroud image is that it resides on less than on 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 less than two, one. Well, let me back it up. The image resides on about one to two microfibers of the cloth. So in other words, each individual thread is made up of about 200 microfibers. So this image resides on less than 1% of a single thread. So it is exceedingly superficial. So Mm -hmm. if you were to take a razor blade and shave the surface of the cloth, the image would be gone. And so, and, and so, yet, interestingly, when you look at the whole pattern of bloodstains, the bloodstains soak all the way through. The water stains from the fire in 1532, they soak all the way through. Of course, the burns burn all the way through. But if you were to flip the cloth over and, and, uh, and look at the other side, you wouldn't see the image of the man. The, so the image of the man appears only on the inside surface of the cloth that would have been facing the, um, the body. And, um, and so... So and so you have to say, well, what medieval artistic process is this? And uh, you know, because 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 that's always the backdrop. It is it is it always comes back to this. It either is or it isn't. Mm. And if it is, you know, if it's if it's not authentic, then it must be the work of an artist. And if that's the case, what process was used to uh, to to create this image? What substances are on the cloth to make the image visible? I mean, I mean, so this is always the either or proposition. It's not we we can't just glibly say, well, it's been proven to be medieval, so it must be a medieval fake. No, 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 not so fast, because 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 if that's the case, now we have to figure out how this alleged medieval artisan did this because we can't figure it out right yeah all right folks i think we're going to take our first break here you've been listening to paratruth radio right here on the paratruth radio network we've been talking to russ uh brilt about the shroud of turin we will be right back after eric's random fact of the day now eric's random fact of the day Did you know that when a crow dies, the other crows investigate? According to FactSlides.com, when a crow dies, other crows come to investigate their death to check to see if there was a threat where the death occurred. The reason that they do this is so that they can avoid the threat in the future. All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And we've been talking to Russ Briolt about the Shroud of Turin, a piece of fabric that is supposedly the shroud that Christ was wrapped in after his crucifixion. Now, Russ, just before the break, we were talking about, you know, how can it be, uh, how can we be sure that th- this is true or false, that this the shroud is actual shroud? Uh, in your opinion, would it be easily faked? Well, that's the problem. No, it, it can't be easily faked because because if we could fake it, we would have, we we would have we would have done it by now. 
the okay. uh, the the because what's interesting is is that oh there's there's been I mean I mean there's been a half dozen attempts to by various people to show how some alleged artist did this back in the uh, back in the Middle Ages, oh, okay. and uh, most of them are pretty terrible. There are a few that that look decent from. Uh, from a distance, but it, but it, but it, interestingly, they they all break down under the um, under the microscope, and uh, be, because again, you know, it has to match that 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 superficiality that we see on the mm. shroud. And but here's the here's the number one conundrum: is this is that, is that the uh, the sequence of events is this? You see, there's no image under the blood. Which tells you that the that the blood was on the cloth first, followed by the image. Now, when did the image get there? I don't know. I'm I'm saying maybe three days later. I don't know. <laughs> it's just that is that the is that the blood was on the cloth first, then came the image. Well, that makes sense if it's authentic, right? I mean, Good Friday followed by Easter Sunday, but it makes no sense if it, if it's the work of an artist. And indeed, every single attempt to replicate the shroud, they just craft their image and then they paint the blood where it's supposed to go. No, no, no. You, 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 you have to craft your whole pattern of blood stains first and then develop your image. And so that is, uh, that would just be a, be a daunting process. And then why would someone in the Middle Ages even bother to do that? True. All right. Um, now this is, I'm just going out on a limb here, it might be kind of far-fetched, but just throwing out a, a, I don't know if it's a theory or not, but you figure when Christ died, well, when he's been crucified, when he was fl- uh, flogged and everything, you know, he, he's pretty dirty, you know, had dirt all over him trying to cross, uh, carry the cross up to the mountain, to, you know, to be crucified and so on and so forth. When he dies, his, the body goes cold, Correct. And so you'd sure. imagine that, and so you'd imagine the amount of sweat that he had at the time, you know, and all the mud that might have been on him while he was hanging may have dried up, and you know, and gotten cold. And therefore, when they wrapped him up, the blood, which is obviously, you know, he's bleeding, he's still bleeding, is going to catch first. But the dirt wouldn't necessarily transfer uh, as quickly because it's just dry dirt, which could also, you know, tell us, or, or I didn't that tell us, but you know. Would you kind of, I don't know if you guys have ever done it, but you wipe your hand, you know, like you get mud on your hand, you wipe it on your shirt. It's never on the inside of the shirt, you know, it's just on the top layer of the mm-hmm. t-shirt. Uh, so is there is there a possibility that this image was, you know, was there naturally already before the resurrection? Uh, it just so appears that it came afterwards due to the amount of dirt that was on him compared to the amount of blood that was already soaking through uh, after well, he was pierced. I don't, and- I don't see how dirt would would cause the image. I mean, the um, the uh, there the um, I mean the the reason that the image shows up is this is that the 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 chemistry is this that the way that they prepared flax linen back in the day they would have soaked in a soapweed detergent and this soapweed is a plant and from the plant they make a detergent they soak in there for days and it acts like a preservative and some kind of a fungicide and, and then anyways they would take it out they'd stretch it out onto the onto the grass to dry out naturally from the sun and in the evaporation process a razor thin layer of sugar compound carbohydrates binds itself to all the thread all the fibers all over the entire cloth. So think of it as like a um, as like a soapy film, and something has interacted with this film in those areas immediately surrounding the body. So the image appears as a as a as a discoloration of the cloth with something having interacted with this carbohydrate layer, and that's why we see the image, not because of any. Were that, that were applied or oils or sweats or aloes because, because, because one, of the, one of the amazing attributes again of the shroud is that you have this, con- this continual image front, you know, of all, the entire frontal image, the entire dorsal image, and there's no areas where that, that appear to be darker or denser or, or areas where that are, that are, uh, that are discontinuous 
And, and, and so, so in other words, this would suggest that it's not the result of anything that, you know, uh, like gas or, or oils or sweats, because, because that's, the, that's the intriguing thing, is that the image intensity is identical, top to bottom, front to back. I mean, it's almost like you need a piece of technology to do that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, um, and, so it, and the image is not the result of heat, because the now interestingly there's a whole pattern of burns on the cloth because it was, it was in this big fire in 1532 and um and so you see these you see these patterns patterns of burns and patches when you when you look at it so the uh, so the image kind of looks like it's like it's lying between these two parallel lines which are basically scorch marks from the fire well interestingly under under ultraviolet fluorescence the burns fluoresce because they are the result of heat, but the image does not fluoresce, and so which which is really intriguing because because when you when you look at the image and the burns um, spectrographically, they appear to both be like a scorch. The image has a similar coloration as the scorch. It kind of it, but it's not. So it looks like a scorch, but it isn't. And so because it because it, cause it's not the result of heat. Mm-hmm. And so this is another one of these perplexing things. You know, how can it look like a scorch but not be a scorch? <laughs> and it and um, so then I say I have a little I have a presentation I do called Seven Secrets of the Sacred Shroud. And and um, and one of those secrets is you know when is a scorch not a scorch? Well, mm-hmm. when is a fire not a fire? Since when can a fire lodge inside of a burning bush and the bur- and the bush doesn't burn up? I mean, I mean, so there are some interesting things that we can com- that, that we can compare with uh, with uh, with scripture. You know, on the on the on the on the day of Pentecost, you know, when the uh, Holy Spirit came down and tongues of fire lit on the shoulders of each person. Well, it didn't burn up. So as though they kind of looked like fire, but it wasn't. And so, you know, so I'm just saying, you know, when is a scorch not a scorch? Maybe when it's, maybe when it's the result of light and not heat. And so you asked about light, and you right. see, I think, I think it is the result of light. Now, here's an here's a incredible piece of data, is that... Back in 2011, research came out of the ENEA, which is which is called doesn't translate into the acronym in, in, in English, but it's called the Italian Agency for New Technologies, and they've been ex- they've been ex- um, um, exploring using ultraviolet eczema lasers. These are high energy lasers, and they determined that a a 40 nanosecond burst. On, a, on, a, on an eczema laser against a control sample of linen achieves the very same depth and coloration that we see on the shroud. And I'm saying, now that's cool. Because, because one of the, because, you know, when you explore the, the resurrection, when I, when I do a presentation on the shroud, I'm going to walk the audience through the science and all of the all of the history. I call my presentation CSI Jerusalem: The Case of the Missing <laughs> Body, and it's um, and so and so and and then and then and then we'll get into well, could it be Jesus? And then because you know, after all, thousands of people were crucified. How do you know it's Jesus? Well, so right. then we compare. So then we have the whole pattern of you know, blood stains around the head from a crown of thorns. Well, who else got a crown of thorns as a it was a singular mockery for the man who claimed to be king of the Jews. And then, and then he was brutally scourged. Why was he so brutally scourged? Because Pontius Pilate didn't think he was guilty of a crime worthy of capital punishment. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want to kill him. So, you know, for his, as you know the story, first he sent him to Herod, and Herod sent him back. And he tried to trade Barabbas, and that didn't work. And so finally he has him scourged to an inch of his life, thinking that when this bloodied hulk of a man came walking back to the courtyard, that they'd say, okay, I guess that's enough. We don't have to kill him. But that's not what happened. They still wanted him dead. And so now you have a man, a crown of thorns, scourging all over the body, no one's in the wrist, no one's in the feet, and a wound in the side, because when they came to Jesus, they noticed he was already dead, therefore they did not break his legs, but Joseph of Arimathea, this is the man who owned the shroud who, and owned the tomb, he had gone to Pontius Pilate to request the, the, uh, the body of Jesus so he could provide a proper burial. 
So before they could release the body to Joseph, they stabbed him in the side to make sure he's dead. And so now you have all these extremely unique, you know, things that are, that are essentially unique to Jesus and his crucifixion. So if you're going to say, who is the man? You know, if I say this, if, 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 if this is the image of a real human being who died from these wounds, this is Jesus. There's no mistaken identity. And... Um, so I'll walk an audience through the whole crucifixion account. Now we get into the tomb. What happened to Jesus in the tomb? What happened you know, at the point of resurrection? Well, it's interesting. There were no eyewitnesses to the resurrection because it happened behind a big stone. And, you know, and, um, and, so, uh, and, and so if you ask the, the question, then you have to answer it by inference, uh, by looking at other verses of Scripture. And fortunately, we have a few. You know, we have the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus goes up to the top of a high hill, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun itself. So this is before the crucifixion. Jesus is transformed into some to being of light of some kind. And then, how does he appear to Saul, who becomes Paul in the on in the um, in the Book of Acts? But in a blinding flash of light, he's blinded for three days. And so I think you'd have to assume that the very split second that Jesus' soul came zooming back into that lifeless body, that there was probably an explosion of light, and then gone. And then um, now, now back to this research that, that came out in, um, in, um, in, in uh, 2011. Researchers at the, with the ENEA, this 40 nanosecond burst, the most significant description in Scripture as to what happened to Jesus comes from 1 Corinthians 15. And it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. For that, you know, and, and, and then he goes on and says, For that which is corruptible must put on incorruptible. That which is perishable must put on imperishable. He's, Paul's talking about an instantaneous transformational event in the future for the individual believer, but this is exactly what happened to Jesus in the tomb. And I'm saying to myself, a flash? Maybe a 40 nanosecond flash? That's seriously cool. I, I would say that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, see, seeing as we're saying, you know, this image had to have been caused by the the light uh, that his body was ra- uh, radiating when his soul came d- back to his body, uh, how much light would that take to burn that image into that cloth and do you think that they would have if if supposedly this is from the middle ages not from actual christ would they have had that type of light source back then oh no absolutely not i mean all we can do with a high energy laser is just replicate one little one little piece of it Mm. this would be the equivalent of having like you know forty thousand lasers all all going off at the same time so we are talking a, a very intense light but at the same time extremely short duration just right. instantaneously boom gone and so it's uh and and so again you know we can't replicate rep, you know, resurrection in the laboratory and so we don't really know what kind of light is involved the best we can come up with is is light from a is light from a high energy laser but that doesn't mean that was laser light i i don't know right, you right. know it's mm-hmm. it's it's just uh it's just as close as we can get right now right now, where, where exactly was the shroud uh, originally located? Well, legend and folklore takes us all the way back to first century with the uh, with the with the legend of King Abgar, and King Abgar the seventh was the uh, was the king of the city state of Edessa. Now, Edessa today is in southern Turkey. It's no longer called Edessa; it's called Urfa. But back in back in the first century, it was its own separate city state, and uh, and the and the and the king of Edessa was dying of leprosy, and Edessa was right on the uh, right on the trade routes 
between the Near East and the Far East, going back and forth between Jerusalem and India, and it, and and so the and so the uh, the uh, the fame and knowledge of Jesus was all over the known world as this amazing healer with all kinds of miracles going on down there in and around Israel, and so he sends a messenger down to down to Israel to uh, to find Jesus and ask him if he could bring healing back to the king. Well, obviously, Jesus had other plans, and so the story goes is that this messenger, along with the apostle Jude Thaddeus, uh, made their way back to Edessa with a cloth with a mysterious image of Jesus on it. Abgar beholds this cloth, and he's healed of leprosy. He becomes a believer. Jude stays there and, 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 uh, and evangelizes the uh, the uh, the city and so and, and so this this cloth is you know later hidden away for safekeeping but it is there for 900 years and it is taken to Constantinople in 944 well around the sixth century it was described as the uh, as the as the true likeness of Christ not made by human hands and around the sixth century around 525 or 5 50 or so, all of your Byzantine icon images of Jesus all change, and they change dramatically, because because prior to the revelation of what is now called the, or, or what is then called the true likeness, representations of Jesus were all over the board. You saw him with short hair, long hair, clean shaven, some with a beard. Everything was it was all very in, uh, very inconsistent. Mm-hmm. But after after the true likeness was was kind of rediscovered in the sixth century, all the images change. Long, uh, long hair, full beard, large, large hollow eyes, flattened nose. Everything becomes stylistically consistent with what we see on the shroud, and so we think that the shroud of Turin is the same thing as the as the uh, as the true likeness. And another thing, and another kind of nail in the coffin, if you will, of carbon fourteen dating is that is that is that we know that the that the uh, that the shroud was in Constantinople in twelve o four and was stolen during the fourth crusade by the French. And then in thirteen fifty three it if it, 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 it kind of it, it, it kind of goes underground for a while from twelve oh four to thirteen fifty three, reappears in 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 um in um in Lorraine, France. It kind of stands the reason it was stolen by the French. And it's um but having said that, we know for a fact that the Shroud was in Constantinople in twelve oh four now, it didn't just get there in 1204. It had been there for hundreds of years. Now, what's interesting is that 1204 is already older than the oldest carbon date of 1260. And so, and so, and so we know the carbon date is wrong. I mean, that doesn't mean I can prove it's first century, but, it, but, I, but, but we know that the carbon date is wrong just by looking at the, at the historical trail. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, and seeing as we know that it was a corner that was sent for carbon dating that had already been touched by dozens of people, if not several uh, no, more than hundred. that, yeah, it's it's hard to believe that anyone could prove one way or the other that this is or is not the the true thing. Um, one thing that uh, came to mind was that um, you know. We're we're seeing all these different relics being discovered. In your opinion, what would that mean for for Christianity or the Christian people finding these relics? Well, I think they are finding uh, relics all and all throughout. I mean, Israel. There's all kinds of archaeological digs going on all over the, all over the Holy Land, and 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 it seems like with every scoop of the shovel, they're finding new evidence that supports the biblical account. And you know, whether it's you know artifacts related to King David or King Saul or King Herod or this, you know, it's like, and you know, so. But I I think as far as the shroud is concerned, I mean, you know. You know, there's a there's a there's a lot of mysteries in the world, but this is the only mystery that goes to the very bullseye of the Christian faith, which is the which is the life, suffering, death, and crucifixion of Jesus and and his resurrection. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I mean, that's it right there. I mean, that is the very core of the gospel, because because the apostle Paul says, look. 
if the if the if the resurrection is not true then our faith is in vain we believe for nothing and so and and so and so the the resurrection is the absolute you know it is the very linchpin of the of the uh of the uh, of the of the whole christian message is that is that is that not only did jesus pay the penalty for sin on the cross but then he defeated the power of death through his resurrection and he offers right. us that same victory by faith i mean that's it right there now just this is pretty much the last question i think of the night here before our next break but uh in regards to these relics and everything that everyone is finding, we know that there's some people, even Christians, who tend to begin to idolize some of these artifacts. I'm sure this Turin is one of them. Definitely the Spirit of Destiny. We talked about it last week that uh, the Spirit of Destiny is one uh, where people believe would get great power if it was in their possession. Um, well, even 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 Hitler was obsessed with it. That was exactly. that was why he invaded Austria was to obtain the Spear of Destiny. Right. Right. Well, for those for those listeners out there that are tuning in right now who who actually see these as some type of power idols or you know see it as something other than just proof of the Lord, the one they should be worshiping. Uh, do you have anything that you'd like to say to them, just to you know help them stay on the right the right path? Oh sure, because you see, I mean, I it, it's it, it's interesting that that the scripture of Paul he describes Jesus as the as the image of the invisible God, and so sometimes I hear people say, well, God wouldn't 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 do it this way because uh, because you know uh, uh, you know Thomas. You know, a, a doubting, doubting Thomas. You know, Jesus said to him, "You know, you know, you know. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen." And that's mm-hmm. true. But we have to remember is that is that Jesus did not condemn Thomas for his unbelief. I mean, he he had every reason to believe, and yet he refused to believe until he was face to face with the resurrected Christ for himself. And you see, I think that's the message of the shroud. I think the mess. I think the shroud has been has has been preserved for this time in in um, in human history. We've never been in a in in a more skeptical or 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 anti-religious age than we are right now. And now think about it. Here in the in the in the 21st century, we communicate more with images than we do with words. Mm-hmm. And so and so I think, you know, is it is it possible that that God preserved an image of his crucified and risen son as a sign, as just a sign to the world. You know, you know, <laughs> I was here and I'm coming back. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I think that that's it. I think it's very quiet witness to the entire world and it's um and it's um and i i never say that the shroud is in fact the borough shroud of jesus i can't mm-hmm. prove that but i just say that you know you know as as we explore the mystery of the shroud the message of the shroud is identical to the gospel or to the scripture there is no difference and so i i can't say that the shroud proves christ but it certainly points in that direction mm-hmm. and um, so i always say to the proverbial doubting thomases of the world listen you know the shroud is not absolute proof but then you got to ask yourself are you going to find anything any better mm-hmm. right all right all right folks we're going to take our second and last break here of the evening you're listening to parachute radio we will be right back after Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. How's it going, Parafans? Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines, and these headlines are from AlteredDimensions.net. Apocalypse Coming? News regarding building of Third Temple to be revealed on August 19, 2016. Jews and Gentiles alike point to biblical verses prophesying the building of a Third Temple in Jerusalem. Given that the prophecy states the building of the Third Temple triggers world-changing apocalyptic events and that the site of the Temple is currently occupied by Muslims, such an endeavor would produce a profound impact across the planet and likely global apocalyptic wars. 
This week, a Bible code expert, Rabbi Matateo Glazerson, revealed that news regarding the Third Temple would arrive on Friday, August 19, 2016. The timing for such a revelation seems feasible, maybe even probable. Just two weeks ago, the 13-year-old daughter of prominent temple activist Amahai Ariel was stabbed to death near Hebron. In response, Ariel and 200 Jews gathered defiantly near the Muslim entrance to Temple Mount and with Muslims watching in disbelief, performed a powerful temple ritual. Witnesses say that the Muslim soldiers standing by to ensure sacred rules of Islam, including non-Islamic prayer, were not violated. Amahai recited a coded prayer blessing the temple site. The defiance of Muslim religious authority over the sacred site was shocking and may result in Amahai being permanently banned from the site. Amahai's desecration of the Muslim holy site was followed less than two weeks later with the release of a new Bible code translated from notable Bible code expert Rabbi Matateo. The rabbi revealed that the decoded message says, The temple will come down to Jerusalem. God will inform on the 19th of August. Israeli news sources say this does not necessarily mean construction of the temple will begin on August 19th, nor the third temple will descend to earth from heaven on that day, but rather that some significant news event regarding the construction of the third temple will take place on Friday, August 19th, 2016. Many Jews and Christians believe the restoration of a great temple atop Temple Mount signals the beginning of the end times. Active serial killer loose in Phoenix. Seven dead at hands of serial street shooter. Authorities in Phoenix today admitted what many have suspected for quite some time, an active serial killer dubbed the serial street shooter or monster of Maryvale is leaving a bloody trail across Phoenix, Arizona. Thus far, several killings have been tied to the shooter. The spate of shootings began on March 17, 2016, when a 16-year-old boy was gunned down while walking along the street late at night. The next night, 21-year-old Diego Verdugo Sanchez was shot while visiting his fiancé's family. The shootings were followed by two killings in April and two more in June. 55-year-old Crystal Annette White was found dead of a gunshot wound on April 19th. 32-year-old Horatio Pina was killed on June 3rd after returning home from work. 19-year-old Manuel Castro Garcia was murdered outside his home on June 10th. The last shooting, definitively tied to the serial street shooter, occurred on June 12, 2016, when three people were shot and killed in front of their home around 3 a.m. The June 12 killings culminated with an unoccupied shot-up car in the area around 2.35 a.m. Briangela White, daughter of victim Crystal White, told reporters, quote, It's scary just knowing that somebody is out there taking innocent lives, someone's mother, someone's daughter, for no reasons, and nobody has any answers, end quote. Police say the shootings are random with no ties between the victims. Witnesses describe the serial street shooter as a light-skinned Latino or tanned white man in his 20s driving a sedan vehicle. The shooter's vehicle color has been variously described, tan, white, dark, leading police to believe he changes vehicles often. All of the shootings have occurred in the working-class neighborhood of Maryvale, with many of the victims shot near their homes. Maryvale is a low-income neighborhood, which suggests the killer may be targeting his victims based on social class and opportunity. A U.S. Marshal explained, quote, He drives into these neighborhoods, sees someone standing outside. The victim's age range is from teenagers to the elderly, male, female. He's just picking targets of opportunity, random individuals outside their homes at night. The shootings have sent a wave of panic through the Phoenix area. Children are being shooed inside before darkness sets in, and shopkeepers have begun closing their stores early. All of the shootings have taken place after dark. Police are unsure why the shootings appear to have stopped on June 12th, but fear the serial street shooter may have moved to a different area. At this time, they do not feel the shootings are tied to last year's Phoenix freeway shootings. Law enforcement agencies and the Maricopa County District Attorney's Office are jointly offering a $30,000 reward to anyone who provides information that solves the serial killer mystery, and they are reminding the public tipsters can remain anonymous. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines.
This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And we've been talking with Bruss Briolt uh, about the Shroud of Turin. He's done a ton of research. And and, we've covered a lot of things here, Russ. (laughs) You pointed out a lot of – I've got to admit, you know, I don't know much about the Turin. You know, I've watched a few episodes here and there uh, on the History Channel and Discovery Channel. But, you know, trying to soak in the knowledge that comes from – the, uh, the research and the evidence and so forth it doesn't really stick with me often. Uh, so it's kind of nice to, to get a little fresh, um, freshened up here on the knowledge of the terrain. And, you, you know, you put it pretty clearly and pretty simple because I know some of those history channels, they use a lot of words that you just don't quite understand sometimes. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but we are coming to the end of the show here. And so we would like to give you another moment to go ahead and tell everyone where they can find you. Uh, and, of course, give out any information you'd like uh, regarding yourself or future endeavors. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, you uh, you can go to my website, which is shroudencounter.com. And that really you kind of tells everything about what I do as a as a as a presenter and a uh, and a speaker. Uh, of course, my main presentation is called CSI Jerusalem, and uh, but then I do I do a presentation. We were talking about Hitler. I do I do one called the day the shroud foiled Hitler, and I document the seven years in which he was taken out of Turin to keep it away from the Führer, who wanted to steal the shroud itself, not just the spear of Longinus or the uh, or the, uh, the spirit destiny. destiny. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, anyways, there's. Um, um, I would. Uh, so, if anyone's interested in um, in in, uh, in in finding out more about what I do, just go to shroudencounter.com and you can you know email me through the website. Awesome. All right, Russ. Thank you so much for coming on with us and uh, indulging our questions. And uh, hopefully, a little later down the road, maybe we'll get you on again, and uh, you have yourself a good night. Well, thank you. Um, uh, it was my pleasure. It was, uh, it was uh, great to meet you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, folks. That was Russ Briault, and we had talked to him about the Shroud of Turin. Uh, just like we said last week about the, the Spear of Destiny, you, you know, you can't get wrapped up in, you know, is it real? You know, should we be worshipping these uh, relics over, you know, Jesus or God themselves. But uh, it's interesting nonetheless. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely interesting. Uh, you, you know, anyone could just do the research. And I, I advise you guys to go ahead and do the research yourself. Uh, you know, check out Russ's website. Check out a couple of other websites as well. You know, compare and contrast. Uh, you know, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's good. To see what people who deny the turi- or the uh, the shroud as being legit, uh, and comparing it to those who believe it is legit, you know, there there is a good thing of comparing, and contrasting the differences there, uh, and of course, ultimately come to your own conclusion. But the one thing that you have to do, and it's important, is that you have to research the Bible as well when you're doing it, because when you're researching the shroud. And I'm sure you'll find it in websites. They'll give you information. But reading it from the Bible itself and seeing how it links up, how the shroud points to Christ and points to the Gospels and the account of Christ's uh, uh, death and resurrection is really something. Uh, And, and, you know, if you don't believe the shroud is real, that's that's all right. There's nothing against you. You know, I I'm a Christian. And for the longest time, you know, I don't I didn't believe it's real. I still am not sure if I believe it's real. But Russ had uh, argued some pretty strong points there, which, you know, at least got me thinking, which is good. You know, thinking is always good. Uh, But in the end, you know, believing or not believing in the shroud isn't going to give you salvation, folks. Simply putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and believing that he is the one and only God, that's going to gain you salvation. Uh, Paul said it himself, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and you will be saved. Simple as that. Doesn't say believe in the shroud or believe in the spirit destiny or you know <laughs> believe in any other relic. So uh, definitely do the research. It's always fun. That's why we do the radio show. Yeah. We like research yeah. on occasion, not always. <laughs> well, I mean, I I'm kind of on the fence with it. Um, I with his points it would seem that it points towards it being real, mm-hmm. but with only being carbon dated once, which, again, you can't really rely on that either because it'll say one thing when it was really something else altogether. Uh, I think that it's a good possibility. Uh, do I believe 100% that it could have could have been and not been faked? No, I think it's it could have possibly been faked. It, very elaborate fake, but it would have... it could have been done uh faked so yeah well absolutely and you know and i think it's weird that the catholic church of all churches <laughs> wouldn't go out of their way to get it carbon dated again just to prove something so i don't know if it's more so out of fear that they don't do it because they're worried that indeed it'll come back a second time and won't be the shroud uh the true shroud uh and that could you know cause issues uh or right. if they're just really sp- Smart, or not smart, but there's two ways here. Either A, they just have the faith that it is, and therefore, you know, let everyone else believe or it is or isn't or whatever, you know, it's up to you. Or they're smart and they're using it as a money maker, which honestly I wouldn't put it past the Vatican. Um, you know, if they're housing it at the Vatican, which obviously they most they, they are, uh, people are gonna come see it, right? If if it's on display. So that's gonna bring in a ton of money, which we know is important. So, you know, the, the, it's sad, but that's that's what people do. They like using things, even if it belongs to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. So next week, folks, uh, wrapping up the Shroud of Turin, uh, we've got Bill Sweet on, who is going to come on and talk to us about the power of prayer. Uh, this guy was actually brought to our attention by Jim Malliard of the Malliard Report. Uh, you guys heard him on our show several weeks ago, and he actually talked about this gentleman, uh, Bill, to uh, have us bring him on. So I think it's uh, kind of an awesome aspect to look at because not too many people, I mean, people pray, you know, this and that, but they never see the, p- the power of prayer because in their minds what they prayed for they didn't get, and, and in a sense they kind of really did. Uh, well... You're right, and it's it's interesting because I've actually recently noticed a lot of posts on Facebook saying, you know, prayer isn't real. You know, if you want to change this country, go out and do something. Don't pray about it because prayer isn't doesn't help. You know, God doesn't help, so on and so forth. And the problem is a lot of like you said, a lot of people pray and don't get the prayers answered. Uh, which isn't true because God always answers a prayer. He either answers yes or he answers no. There is no maybe, you know. Um, so unfortunately, people tend to take the negative side of things and say, oh, he said no. Therefore, that means he must not answer me or not care or not exist and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's a sad thing because we do need prayer. And I know I've talked about it in the past. There have been several times where I've prayed, uh, whether it had to do with uh uh, demonic entities uh, in fact, affecting other people or myself or other things, which I'm, we'll probably talk about next week, so I'm not going to spoil too much. But prayer does work, and sometimes it God just says no. You know, prayer always works. He always listens to those who really uh, uh, are in need of him. So well, I don't know. I, it's yeah. because humans want what they want. And if they if they don't get it, that means that yeah. their answer their prayers weren't answered. When really he was answering that prayer by saying, "No, that's not what you need. <laughs> that's not what you need. Exactly. That's exactly true. You know what? God does not give you what you want. He gives you what you need. Now there are occasions where maybe he'll, you know, what you want is also what you need. Right. <laughs> and that's just a pack of. Well, maybe if it's a pack of bubble gum, maybe he'd be like, no, but you can go for the uh, Denta Fresh over there or something instead. Uh, <laughs> are you saying God's saying these people's breath stink? What is going I'm on? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Come on now. Uh, but you know, it's even those little tiny things in life that God actually does and is willing to direct you to do. Uh, there's there's no task too big or too small for God to. Uh, interact with you so right. it's just it's something that we as humans do need to get past uh many of you people are just prideful and yeah it's gimme 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 never give and when they don't get 
they gave up, you know? So, but I'm looking forward to it. It'll be, be uh, interesting and fun conversation next week, I think. Yeah, I think it'll be an awesome show. So make sure you guys tune in next week, just as always, right here at the Paratruth Radio Network. Uh, You can find us on Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, YouTube, uh, any podcasting uh, software apps that you can research. We're probably on those as well. So uh, (laughs) make sure... (laughs) Make sure that uh, you find us on Facebook and Twitter and follow and like the pages as well as follow us on Spreaker and subscribe on YouTube so that you get updates every time a new show is active and ready. On that note, folks, that's all we got for the Shroud of Turin. Until next week when we will be talking to Bill Sweet about the power of prayer, you can find us same time, same channel. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Paratruth Radio and you would like to listen to it again or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can listen to them on HD at our website, paratruthradio.com. And you can also find us at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, and YouTube. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for brand new updates of our show every day. 